Right, so Ada's with Tech Talks. Episode 5, Ada and Ruth chat about stuff. <laughs> One time. Here we are. Hi, everyone. Hi. Or oh, one person. We have one person. Should we, should we chat? Yeah. Should we, should we chat about what we were chatting about? Okay. So, um, I was doing a lightning talk last week mm. um, at JS Oxford. Uh, so, it was a 10 minute talk. Now, now there are rules for when you talk on stage, aren't there? They're, like, there are rules that I set myself about talking. Um, you can actually check this video out online, by the way. They have actually put it up it is on YouTube. I'll put the um, link in later. Yeah, it's quite a funny talk. So it's 10 minutes. Now, all the other lightning talks are obviously prepared talks with slides. What I decided to do was an introduction to the Web Audio API via live coding. Now, my rules for talks are prepare your talk. I did not prepare this talk. Uh, do not drink before a talk. I had one bottle of beer before this talk. Um, and do not live code in talks. Now, some people live code really, really well in talks. That's not a rule for everybody, but me, mm, I've done it a couple of times and it's not been particularly successful. It's like doing live demos in talks. Now, I can prepare demos a lot better than I can live code. Yeah. I didn't do any of these things. I broke all of my rules. Um, but we did, and well, I did manage to live code a little laser sound in 10 minutes but it did actually take me the full 10 minutes and i had to copy and paste a whole function <laughs> at the end of it to actually finish it because um the web audio api is such a massive um subject to talk about uh, there's a lot to it um there, there was just kind of a lot going on even though i was writing just a very very small amount of code hmm. um well it's not even a small amount of code like just to do a small thing uh, there was a lot of stuff that you needed to know to do that small thing, which I tend to find with the audio API probably more so than some of the other APIs I've used, but I feel like it's just a very big API and there's a lot going on. Um, but I think that highlights the extensibility of the web, because mm. we were talking about that, weren't we? Like, um, I always feel the need to go in and learn the APIs themselves so that I know what's going on, but actually... I don't need to. I could have used a library that probably has a method dot laser or something similar, yeah. right? Um, but no, no, I had to create an oscillator. Um, I had to change the type of that oscillator to have different waves, and we can talk about that later. Mm. Um, I had to create a, another sort of gain node which changes the volume um, and do a couple of other different methods just to make this laser instead of just probably having a library out there would be like dot laser. Um, and I think this is, I think that's okay. I think it's all right to use the things that are built on top of these APIs because that's the whole point of it. It's supposed to be extensible. And I'm um, never really satisfied. So you, you mentioned extensible a couple of times. Do you want to like elaborate about like what the extensible web means? It's, yeah, it's all about the manifesto, right? It's all about this idea that, and correct me if I'm wrong because you probably know more about it <laughs> than I do. This is my understanding of it. I've never actually read uh, a lot about it. It's the idea that, you make things low level enough so people can build on top of them and extend them. Mm -hmm. So you try to give like the most core functionality that you can um, so that everything can be built on top and people can um, change it for their needs and allow other people, like give it to other people, like the functionality that they've had, like share it with other people, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I guess you could look at web components as a good example mm. because the idea behind that is you make something and you can package it up and you can give it to somebody else. Yeah. Right? Sort of. Yeah, um, no, that makes sense. I'm, yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned it earlier, service workers, like another good example. Yeah, so that was my example because that is something that I've never really tried to um, learn uh, mm. at, at that level. But then I don't know very many things that make service workers easy, even though you mentioned a couple of things. Um, I'll get back to that. It was more that whenever I do um, add a service worker to a project, I tend to either use somebody who's written one recently or has written a good one recently, and I'll be like, oh, hey, that service worker you wrote for that project, can I just take a look at it? And then it was probably something that it's similar that I need for what I'm doing at the time and I'll just sort of go through it and change the bits that I want. Um, I've never really sort of looked into it, but there's probably some tools out there that make that simpler because it's a lot to get your head around, I think. Yeah, I, like, I've written like a service worker once and then I just copy and paste it and tweak it for every single project from then on. 
Like yes. It's, it's low level enough that, that you don't have to write it again and again and again and it gives you huge potential for extending its functionality. Whereas like the old APIs, like the AppCache API, where it's like, yeah, it's a high level API, but it ended up, because it wasn't extensible, because it didn't match what people needed, it effectively became a largely useless API. Yeah. Um, whereas so, um, the equivalent um, API service worker is a lot more ex um, extensible and can be used for many different purposes, not just offlining and caching. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. There are some crazy uses of it that people are coming out with. Yeah. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I'm quite interested in um, <laughs> what people are coming out with. Uh, but there are some tools to make that easier. You were mentioning one before. Oh, um, Workbox, uh, Google's Workbox thing. Yeah. yeah. Really useful for, um, for putting together service workers based upon your routing object, which is really cool. Uh, okay, right. We also have a, a number of MIDI controllers here, yes. one of which we're actually using. Oh, yeah, so uh, I have cool. my one down here, um, which I use for most web MIDI stuff, but right now it's being used to control the um, the video stream for this. So if I put different pads, it actually changes between different applications. I love, I love that use. Right? Well, yeah. I, I think we're going to talk about this sometime in the next hour, because a lot of people think that MIDI is just sound. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that it's just a data protocol. Like you're just pressing buttons and you're turning dials and data is just being sent yeah. to your computer in this case. Um, so or it's used for sound a lot, but you yes, can use it for that's, anything. That's where it came, that's where it came from. So, uh, you've got the other one. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm extremely lucky because when Ruth came to visit me today, she brought me a present. <gasps> Look at, at all those <laughs> So I want to play with that. That looks amazing. Oh. So if you were one, if you're watching and you are wondering, um, the first one was an Ake, um, and the second one uh, is a Novation Launchpad. The Ake LPD8 is a really good one to get started with. It's only about thirty pounds, about mm. thirty-five euro, I think, um, and it's just got some pads. So these are like buttons and some dials. Um, so that's a really good one that you can just um, plug into your computer via USB um, and that's a really good one to get started. The other one was the Novation Launchpad Pro, which is a, more, a little bit higher end. Um, you can get Launchpad Minis, uh, which are very similar. They don't have quite the same functionality, but then if you are looking for more buttons to press, that is yeah. also a very good option. I mean, just yeah. in case you were wondering, because a lot of people always say to me, um, what MIDI controller should I buy? Uh, if you Google MIDI controllers, <laughs> uh, there's so many of them. Um, and as long as they are going to connect to your computer, either via USB or Bluetooth, mm -hmm. um, they should all work in your browser with the web MIDI API, yeah, which we will talk about in the next hour, won't we? Hmm. Um, MIDI controllers can look like anything. Like um, the piano okay. over there is a MIDI controller. Yep. Um, you can get MIDI controller drum kits. Like these ones, which just have knobs and buttons. This one is... 64 buttons, which is amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, you can so get cool. ones that look like game controllers. No. Yeah, and you can get wind instrument ones as well. A wind instrument <laughs> MIDI controller? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So does it like detect how hard you're blowing for like as a um, MIDI That's input? a really good question. I think they have, um, from what I remember from when I last Googled, I think they have two different versions. I think you mm. get one where it's, there's no onboard audio. Yeah. And it's just sending messages, but I don't know uh, what kind of messages it sends. So I don't know yeah. if it detects breath. And then there's one that has onboard audio and that's more expensive. So it, it, it would probably sound like a clarinet or something like that, okay. I would imagine. Um, and that is just MIDI enabled sort of electronic wind instrument. Yeah. That's cool. Is, yeah, and, and they're, they're very cool. So but because it is just a, a data like interface, like it doesn't care if what you're using is a piano or a drum kit or like a one foot by one foot sheet of buttons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, it's like it's it doesn't really matter. So um, you could do stuff like you could build a web app which isn't for MIDI inputs and then control it from a clarinet. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, all the, I was refreshing myself on the MIDI specification. So MIDI um, just came around in 1983, the first MIDI spec came out, and it came out because there was a rise in popularity of electronic instruments. So this is yeah. instruments that were sending electronic signals or being made from electronic signals, and that's how their noises were being made. And somebody, or a few people were like, if we've got all these instruments that are all, have electronic, like, are enabled with electricity already, can't they send signals to each other? And that'd be a really good way for them to communicate. And also communicate with equipment as well, so like recording equipment, um, equipment that you find in recording studios and things like that, equipment that you find on stage, um, all that kind of stuff. And so a bunch of industry experts and music manufacturers got together and they were like, let's write a protocol that's the same across everything. Yeah. Um, and so they did, that's when General MIDI 1 came out. And they do have this set, um, and I don't know it off by heart, but they have this set, uh, like the messages do mean something. So you have a set message for like C on a piano. Yeah. And um, if you have velocity enabled sort of keys or pads, so that's the yeah. harder you hit them, they all have like messages for that as well. So you get a higher um, sort of value um, for the harder you hit them and then the lower value for the softer you hit them. So, so things like yeah. that do exist. So you should be able to say, you know, this is a piano or this is a drum pad, uh, but I'm not quite sure which numbers are what. Right. That makes yeah. sense. That does make sense. <laughs> uh, so you might have to like, what I tend to do when I'm working with new controller is I just go through and work out which messages are being sent by each dial or pad or whatever it is that I'm, I'm using. Um, and then I kind of hard code that into the software. That makes sense, especially because like all pads are different. So you're probably just going to have the same you probably just kind of want to select an instrument and have a preset list of buttons and dials it responds to. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, you kind of got that sort of controller sort of methodology when you get deep into it, where you just got. Um, I tend to do something really hacky with mine. I just have like a JSON setup of like these are the pads and this is the on press values, and then you'll have this sort of control where you're like um, this button is the button that I want to use for this and this button is the one, one that I want to use for this and that's the thing that you end up changing yeah. for the software rather than having to actually hard code every single value in. Okay, does that cool. make sense? It does make sense. <laughs> okay. Um, I feel like I'm explaining it right on a Thursday afternoon. Yeah. Uh, so last year we, we worked together on um, a project uh, for Samsung um, called VJ OTG. Yeah. For like DJ on the go. Um, I'll drop a link into the video down there. Yeah, um, I'm gonna fire it up in Firefox. Um. So this stands for VJ on the go, and it was an app we built to highlight the functionality of Samsung Internet Browser on uh, on the S8 phone at the time, because that was the phone that just came out. Obviously, there are better phones available now, and other phones available. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it completely worked. It's just this little um, application where you have a screen that you can actually project because you can actually plug in. We plugged in a little pocket projector to the phone, yeah. didn't we? And we, yeah, they. You've actually. Is this getting cast? Oh, yeah, it's just getting oh, cast. Awesome. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> I'm so totally technically into it. So yeah, on the on the right, we've got this is sort of emulating. Um, some emulating this the controller. Okay, yeah. yeah. So we've got like eight pads, and then we have eight sliders which emulate the dials, and you just change mm. the the values for the whatever's being shown on the screen. You can change what's being shown on the screen as well. But I think we can probably code something with the MIDI API from scratch just to see how yeah. you can get buttons out. Um, yes. Um, we can probably add some audio in as well. Yeah, that's what a good you idea. Normally do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then at some point we should have a look at this and see how we fix it up. Yeah, I'm gonna do it in glitch.com. Okay, this is great because I don't usually use glitch. I usually use Copen. Um, it's so good that there's so many little things that you can use, mm. isn't it? It really is. I think that's big enough. Um, can we also look at the code which? We wrote for, um, well, what you wrote for this. Yeah, so that's the code that I always copy and paste. So, yeah, that would, where would I put it? Yeah, so on MIDI success is a function you run once you have got 
you scroll down um, when you have gone like hey is the midi controller here yeah well yes it is You've got press MIDI. navigator don't request midi access which in terms of promise yeah let's just um part of me is like hmm, we could have a go at like using these um web components we built but i think it's more interesting to just do it from scratch let's see so yeah So this is all promise based, right? Yes, it is, yeah. Cool. Um, so I'm going to use this using async functions. Oh, cool. Very nice. I know. I'm, I use all of the cool toys. Um, so. So the sysx is full supply that we have in there is basically saying um, we're not going to be sending any information back to the device. Okay. Because that is some functionality that we can have. That's how um, you can do cool things. So, um, these, this MIDI controller specifically has got, this is the Novation, um, has got uh, LEDs um, in on all of the pads. So I didn't realize so, you could do, you could write back. So we could, I could write a JavaScript app to do cool visualizations on here. Yes, you could. Yeah. So there I could are use... some security vulnerabilities with this. Oh yeah. Um, a little bit, yeah. Like, uh, uh, because you can use that functionality to send like the settings of instruments. If you've got like a synthesizer, or oh, this is how I understand it anyway. If you have uh, a synthesizer, so that would be a controller like that that has onboard audio and you can just play it yeah. as a sort of instrument. So you have, um, you know, I've got a sine wave and then I'm going to put, I'm going to change this wave so it makes this really cool sound and then I'm going to set it to these buttons and then I'm going to play it. Yeah. Kind of is essentially a kind of synth. Um, then you can send back this information to set it up as to the last um, settings that you have that, that synth on and you mm. can save different settings for different times that you've used it. Okay. For some older MIDI controllers, that's a real, real problem because they didn't have the functionality that we have now and you can reset settings which you shouldn't be able to reset and kind of brick the controller, essentially. Oh, shoot. Yeah, so it becomes unusable, or at least that yeah. is essentially the idea. Um, so that's kind of, that's one. Of, I think that's one of the big reasons that Firefox hasn't, um, um, hasn't in hasn't got the functionality for yeah. web MIDI yet. Which is totally um, understandable. Yeah, I believe. I'm guessing they'd have to do something uh, like create a list of all old MIDI controllers uh, to cool, blacklist it? them or something. Um, yeah, or... Yeah. I, there's not a good way around it. I like allow the user to say, yeah, this is all right. Um, but something which sounds really interesting from what you mentioned is that I can send colors back to here. Yes. So I could <laughs> I could render like a 3D scene using Canvas API and uh -huh. 3JS and then render it 64 bytes. Oh no, like on an 8 by 8 yes. little screen, which would be really cute. Yeah, you can definitely do that. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to do that. <laughs> Although I've never, I've never actually played with this X3. I've never actually sent it back. Yeah, oh, I should learn how to do it and give it a go. Yeah, yeah, I kind of wanted, I kind of want to do that. As well, I might. I just got a new MIDI controller, which has got LEDs in as well. So yeah, we have. Okay. Our... So. Oh yeah, so this is the thing which gets the details. So yeah, access MIDI. Then. Oh yeah. What we want to get back is on MIDI success, we pass the data back, or we, the data is then given to us. So these MIDI messages are what we're looking for. Cool. So we want to get this. So, uh, so I'm going to copy and paste that in. 
so equals um actually so I'll just call that MIDI I can't even type on my own key. <laughs> So for all inputs, I'll just start on. Oh yeah, so I'm just gonna just do a new function here. Okay. Um equals actually let's see. That's probably an event, I guess. So, um, let's do console.log mm -hmm. and see what it looks like. Cool. So, okay. Um, what we can do is because it definitely found something. Um, but it didn't tell us to choose a controller, which is odd. I'm not sure if it should. Let's just log the out again. Yeah, we, we can set an error as well. Oh yeah, because this might error, so I'm just gonna go. Um, So we get an error of one more. So we get the MIDI access. Oh, input zero, output one. Hmm. So it has an output, but not an input. See, it makes me think that this it hasn't detected this yeah, me or too. this. So I'm going to disable my MIDI key so that we can, we won't be able to change the thing anymore, but we might be able to use this. Okay. Okay, we've got size one now. That's good. Yeah, there we go. Cool. And it sees this one fine. Yeah. So. But we can just do stuff with this. Oh, actually, mm -hmm. whilst we're here, I can demo VJ and PV. Oh, yeah, that was fine. There we go. Turn this knob back. So yeah, I can turn these knobs and stuff changes. Uh, I forgot that I put velocity on this. And yeah. Actually, if you do it softly, you don't get anything. If you do it hard, you get like that. I'm sure the invert was on something. Oh no, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, I think because they they act on different source. I think no, I think these ones go on everything. Like this is like a, yeah. this one affects the CSS properties. Yeah, and that's um, brightness. Oh yeah, that was blur. Uh, yeah, you just did some simple CSS. Um, yeah, filters, um, which is always a quick one. Actually, this is like a cool thing to talk about. Um, because we did like a lot, we connected together a lot of cool stuff for this project. Um, <laughs> yeah, we did actually. Like we just got all like, the cool. Um, there was almost too much stuff to talk about. To yeah. Um, so yeah, there's the aforementioned web MIDI, which connects via MIDI 
and then you wrote these web components allowing you to emulate devices. So if you notice, we have eight buttons and eight um, sliders, uh -huh. and those buttons match to the the eight pads and the eight knobs on here. Yeah. Um, so that was super cool. Yeah, so each sort of is, is a component unto itself, um, which is actually based on something you'd written to start with, which is this really nice class way of building up, like extendable way of building up this component. So all yeah. I had to do was take that, um, but make sure that we could, like, it's, it's, uh, how am I going to explain this, explain this right? So the easiest way when I think when you do it, when you're using web components is to actually go back to the HTML yeah. and go, what do I want to write when I want this to be displayed on the page? Yeah. So we did like a MIDI dash CC, I think, didn't we? But we CC, did, yeah. by the way, stands for continuous controller. So that's the sliders and the dials and, and things that, that you get on um, MIDI controllers. So not the pads, basically, yeah. and not keys. Uh, and so you had like MIDI CC, and then you passed in attributes such as, I can't really remember because it's Oh, wait, let's have a take a look at the uh, source code. But we have things like you can set up your, probably, I would imagine, yeah. um, Oh, okay, here we go. So, um, at the bottom, MIDI controller. Yeah, I would imagine I would have put in, yeah, the channel, the note, and um, the value. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'd want to put in a, yeah. in, a, in a component. So that would be the data that is um, sent back from that particular, uh, like, MIDI pad or MIDI dial, yeah. right? Um, and then you just have to add that into your HTML and it's, it's done. And it's the same with the pad, so you just do MIDI, MIDI dash pad. Um, but it was all extended off from one MIDI class eventually, yeah. wasn't it? I, I think, think so, you might yeah. have refactored that for me. So mm. I just written sort of two <laughs> that were basically the same. They just did very, ever so slightly different things. But then they spit out onto a page, like the little form element. So you either have a button, um, which has all the stuff around it that gives you the right value when you press it. Um, when you click on it or you or you touch it or whatever and then uh the same with the, the dial it's just um a range input yeah. so range inputs are great when you're working with audio by the way um yeah. and, like, and so that's where you see a slider on the front yeah. end because i didn't want like you can make sliders look like actual dials but they're fun, like they're really you, hard to use with a mouse. They are really hard to use with a mouse. They're also really hard to use on a touch screen. We were doing oh yeah, screen, remember? So I thought it was just easier for usability just to keep it as a as yeah. an engine. But uh, uh, so yeah, that was that in itself is just one of the things that we did. Because the other thing that really fascinated me, um, because I've had the same problem. This is kind of came off the back of the fact that I was doing a talk at the time, which I still have done a couple of times this year which was um, doing visualizations based on music, so taking the web audio API, using it to analyze sound and then creating visualizations. So was, um, I've been doing a lot of work on 2D Canvas, yeah. which when you are analyzing audio in your JavaScript, there's a couple of other bits going on. You're kind of, I was drawing a lot of shapes on the canvas and they were changing depending on the data that I was getting. And a lot of stuff was going on in the main thread. I have since yeah. been working a lot this year with workers to try and um, make that more formal, but um, it just kind of breaks. Yes. And one thing that you did was you took everything off and made it a 3D context rather than a 2D context. So we had like this WebGL, uh, yeah. <laughs> sort of really um, it's actually a really like intricate system going I on. I should probably do a talk about what I did here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so essentially we were trying out lots of different ways to do visual effects, like yeah. performantly. So we started off by just doing canvas as you've been doing previously. But then we found out alongside the analysis, it was quite slow. And then we started looking at, could we do effects using the web audio API? Yes. yes. So, so we'd run the canvas and like the video data in, we would, we would dump it as in buffer. into channels. Yeah. As buffers <laughs> into an audio buffer, which would then run into um a script processor yeah into a script <laughs> processor <laughs> and then we would do audio effects on it like we would um uh run oh, what were some of the audio filters so we had we like uh we mostly worked with the bicord filter but the bicord oh, yeah. filter gives you 
I mean, that is that has been up until this. I think it was this year. I'm not sure quite sure when the Frankenstein eyes came in. The only big filter effect that you yeah. had in, in the audio API, um, and that would give you like high up uh, high pass, band pass, low pass. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, uh, they're, they're all <laughs> I know them yeah. all off by heart. All your basic filter types, basically. So something like a low pass, basically you set a frequency and it passes everything below that frequency. Yeah. So when you're doing that with, um, like, essentially image data, yeah. you do get some really, really interesting effects. Like, it's quite easy to envisage what that would be if we did it with auditory data. Like, yeah. um, you, you got audio behind, data, like, yeah. you, yeah, you have, it's going to cut off all the high frequencies. I guess and it's that. not perfect. No filters yeah. are absolutely perfect because they're obviously dealing, they're obviously emulating sort of analog signaling, which mm. is um, a thing unto itself. You're going all the way back. Like I've been doing a lot of work with filters this year, and you're going all the way back to how a filter sort of circuit works. And you're, like you're going through like all the sound going forward, so that's your feed forward, yeah. and all the sound going back, which is your feedback, which is feedback. It means a whole different thing to me now. Um, and you're going all the way. So, so there's no perfect way of actually cutting off all frequencies mm. like but for the most part you know low pass yeah. it's going to pass through the low frequencies so when uh, you're so doing yeah, on an the, image yeah like, so we're doing it on image data yeah and which is very cool so a high pass filter on image would essentially filter out any any bits where the image is changing rapidly so edges yeah so a bit where it goes from light to dark um and but yeah, and it worked. Like it worked okay. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite fast enough to do it real time. No, I'm, I do wonder. I have been meaning to go back to that because I have written a sort of draft about it. So I think yeah. it's really interesting. Um, and going back to it now that we have <coughs> we have off screen canvas. Oh yeah. Uh, which is a sort of worker to render canvas. Um, it's kind of it's kind of a weird one because you have I haven't really played too much with pulling all the canvas out into the worker and then sending it back. You can do this with or hack with off screen where you can um, get it to render like a frame within your code, yeah, and then put, sort of paint it back to the canvas that you have, or you can pull a whole bunch of stuff out into a separate file. Um, so we've got that. We've also got audio worklets now. Which oh, we yeah. sort of had at the time, but um, they were still, I think, sitting behind a flag in Chrome. So I we didn't have them in yeah. Samsung Internet Browser, or we don't have them in Samsung, Samsung Internet Browser. So we were apprehensive to work with those. And they were basically there to replace the script processor. So that would be an interesting, that thing, would to be an interesting yeah. thing to try. Like, could we pipe that image data through a worklet into off-screen canvas mm. back onto the canvas and would that improve in performance? That would be a really interesting to try. I think we should try that. Speaking yeah. of stuff that's like off-thread and stuff, have you um, seen um, um, Comlink, which yes. uh, does sound this one? Yes. It's so good for making like multi-threaded stuff in JavaScript look really well. Okay, so really yeah. do you need to look into that a little bit more because I've only ever just yeah. Um, done the really long-winded way of post method and these methods, all that kind yeah. of stuff. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Comlink makes that syntax a lot nicer to use. Yeah. Um, so, well, essentially, it kind of allows you to write functions which don't have, where you no longer need to do that. So when you call a function on, so you essentially declare a function in a in a thread and then comlink gives you the abstraction of that function where it will handle taking care of it like taking care of the post message and taking it back and like managing the data correct like serializing the data correctly and performantly what when you said serializing the data correctly so there was he actually Sama from google actually wrote Clooney as well which oh yeah i, I haven't heard of that one so i understood that to be passing the messages in the correct order. Because you know, if you're passing messages one at a time, yeah. there's no way of knowing, like from like one specific worker, Yeah. and you're looking at your main thread script, like, and I could be wrong, so I'll probably Google this before we put it out there. Um, there's no way of knowing which order they're coming in on. 
Yeah. So, for instance, one of the things that I did recently was I took the analysis of my audio out into a worker. Yeah. Um, because that was quite heavy on the main thread. Um, so I popped that into a worker, but what I'm not doing is checking because uh, I'm doing that in a request animation frame. Yeah. So that's kind of happening quite a few times a second. I kind of reduce it down to about 30 frames a second just because there's no need for me to be doing that at 60 yeah. frames a second. Um, like, there's no way of me knowing that the analysis at that point in time I'm getting back is actually the next bit of analysis or whether they're ah. coming through in different orders. Now, for the most part, it actually doesn't matter that much because I'm only using it to make some pretty stuff on the screen and people don't like you don't notice your eyes and your ears are mm. not so matched up that so if there were two frames switched round yeah. no one would know that. not really um but i do believe it was looking at doing that and there was something that came out of chrome dev summit where they are looking to extend the spec so there are some flags that you can i, I believe anyway from what i understood i only sort of half watched um the talk when they were talking about it unfortunately but they they were actually suggesting that they add to the spec so that we had the ability to do that. So yeah. that we knew this which will be atomic message was which. in Shared Array Buffer. I'm guessing is the mm. API there. Yeah. Because a top um shared array buffers were a really cool way of sharing data um oh, yeah. between threads. Unfortunately, due to Spectre, yeah. it became a bit of a security vulnerability. So there's been lots of work going on making sure it actually is safe to use and it's landing again in, in a browser near you. Well, actually, I think it already has landed, like you can start using it. I think it's been behind a flag in Chrome for a little bit, but I okay. haven't gone back to try it again yet. I just haven't, because that's, uh, that's a really good solution for me in my audio analysis, because I can keep the data in a shared array buffer mm. um, and both all my scripts can see it doesn't matter how many I have, they can see the shared data, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we put this back on the video because um, we're like chatting. Oh, actually, I should show Comlink actually what it looks like. Okay. Yeah, let's so do that. Have a look at Clean as well just to see. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, in Comlink, you like define a class and a proxy, and essentially it proxies one function into. Um, so you define a function in your worker uh -huh. and you can proxy it back to the main thread or vice versa. And then you can start calling that like normal and it just returns a promise, which can um, which can re resolve as it's, when it's done. Um, so Clooney is really, really amazing. Like it's, it's sorry, Comlink. And so when you, Clooney is in George Clooney. Yeah, because it's something to do with the actor pattern, which they're very hot on right now. So, <laughs> you might remember cleaning GitHub. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Uh, let's see if I've understood it correctly. Um, King is an actor, no verb. Fast is similar to Trinity, instantiated and run in a worker, keeping the main thread responsive. Mm. Um, Okay, this is something I'll definitely check out later though. I think it's worth checking out if 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 it's a kind of if you're doing lots of stuff in off thread then um mm, it looks like it creates workers for um things that you define, doesn't it? So maybe I got wrong that it was doing it in this order thing. Yeah, but it's um seems like a really cool, um, cool project. I'm gonna definitely check that out later because, like, making the web multi-threaded is like a really important thing for gaining performance, especially if we're doing really graphics-heavy yeah. stuff like yeah. like we tend to do a lot. Yeah, I think one of the things that we failed to mention was, um, the reason that we switched from a two D canvas to three D canvas. Is that meant we were automatically switching from CPU to GPU? Yeah. Um, as a quick win, they um, were, I'm pretty sure they were doing some work around 2D Canvas being rendering on the GPU in mm. some browsers, but I'm not quite yeah. sure the status of that. But also the performance benefits um, by doing it using WebGL instead of on a canvas 
don't just come from it being on the GPU, um, but that all of the calculations which I'm doing can be run in parallel. Um, because instead of doing it pixel by pixel, it just does like a bunch of the pixels. Um, so you end up writing your code differently. So instead of, if I wanted to draw a square on the screen, I wouldn't say draw a square. I would, I would write some shader code to be, is this pixel within the bounds of where the square would be? And if so, be this color. Um, so you end up thinking about everything being backwards. So for example, if you wanted to draw a checkerboard, you would probably do something like is 0.25 away across the screen and 0.2 down, is this in a white square or a black square? And then you draw white or black. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I actually took to learning Book of Shaders oh, yeah. last month, which I was going to do for Cofember, but I sort of ran out of time. I've been trying to get back on it this month so I could, like, this is the thing that I'd love to do by the end of the year. Because, like, there's not a lot of chapters to Book of Shaders. Yeah. But um, if you're interested in learning shaders, there's a really, really good book. It's online, it's free, and you can read each chapter. Yeah. But each one's really, really in depth. So the first thing you do is you just go through the kind of nuts and bolts of how a shader works and mm. that kind of concept which is quite hard to get your head around and you're so used to me for me anyway working on a 2d canvas where you're looking at every single pixel and the data from those pixels yeah um and you go through a lot of things like shaping functions and things like this to start with i've just got into the next chapter which is color so we're just looking at different like you know how to make mm. the screen different colors and things like that and then the chapter after that is shape but every single one's quite a big chapter there's a lot of tasks to do yeah um and i kind of want to go through every single one so that i can practice cool and practice it, it is yeah um but i i start like it's been on my list to do all year after we did this project yeah. because uh -huh. i've seen all the uniforms that you know we've, we've built this system with like you can basically write your own shader and put it into this system yeah um and I was like, that's really, really cool. And I hadn't made a lot of graphics for VJOTG because I wanted to like, really understand what yeah. <laughs> this thing was really doing. Um, so it's yeah. like, <laughs> I'm getting there. But it is a very different way of doing yeah. it. So the graphics portion of VJOTG is essentially, um, so we had one suite of web components for accessing the MIDI controller, which then, and that fired events for when you're doing stuff, um, the um, the web components for the graphics side of it essentially didn't do anything apart from look at the attributes you'd given it and and export that as like a chunk of shader code. Yeah. Then the um, um, so that you would write out your your this HTML, which would essentially each small line of HTML would represent maybe like a dozen or two dozen lines of shader code. And then the 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 outer controller would then on first load go through all of these, build up a big shader, like by look turning each HTML chunk into a blob of shader code, concatenate them all together and then send it to the graphics card. Like I completely forgot. <laughs> the, um, the web components that we made for MIDI were actually sending out the MIDI messages, weren't they? Yeah. So if you're just if you're not actually using a MIDI controller and you're using the interface, they actually send the same. They do. Yeah. We did that. That was a pretty cool thing to that do. That was so cool. Like we were, like um, like the MIDI emulator we were doing was actually emulating like the event. It was really neat. I think the way that we knew, especially with that. The way that you had created the graphics like web components as well like normally you do something like that entirely in javascript which i know it's yeah. sort of powered by javascript but you forget that actually um whoever's then using it can just write html to build yeah. a new like graphical like thing like a new vj thing um and actually don't need to touch the javascript at all they just need yeah. to put some tributes in and even stuff like for the events um like I, you were defining uniforms in the WebGL code by mm. writing a bit of HTML, and that HTML would create a new uniform, which would listen for Web MIDI events and then update the uniform pr accordingly. Yeah. 
So you didn't actually need to use any JavaScript to hook up the MIDI controller to the WebGL. You could do it all in the HTML. Yeah, I know. that's kind of insane, yeah. isn't it? It was. Yeah, that was a that was a fun project. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, and the last thing we did. So all of the functionality for. Um, so I think it's these buttons. Oh, not that one. So all of these buttons here, the four bottoms. The four buttons at the bottom. Pads five to pads eight. Yeah. Um, so this should map to these ones. I think so, yeah. yeah. The only thing you don't get on the web interface is velocity. Oh no, these are, so this is upside down. So one, two. Oh, of course. Yeah. One to four are at the bottom on this pad, <laughs> oh, but one to four are at the top on yeah, this one. Which means very. Um, yeah, okay. So now they're sending out um, like a middle value because they don't. So if I hit that one harder, it'll actually go brighter. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I remember now. So, um, yeah. Go on, talk about CSS. All right. So <laughs> one thing we did is that we wrote a small script which would listen to every single MIDI event that comes out of the MIDI controller and map it by its name as a, as a custom CSS property on the body. So if we go to um Yeah, we were using custom properties. Yeah. Yeah, I love this. Um so where, actually when you play music. So where did we do it? Um You can get the JavaScript to pick up on those events as well. That's why we did it, wasn't it? Here we go. Okay no, so we did it on the on the root element of the visuals. So if you turn these knobs, like these numbers change. <laughs> <laughs> And so you can hit this and the number in the in the CSS property change. So it's like all these values here. And um and so we we wrote CSS like one giant CSS filter, which we've got here, which would combine together all of the values. Well, actually you no, know, just the pad pads one to pad four values from the CSS property to... We had one originally, didn't we, for the beat of the music. What happened to that? So oh, yeah. we were doing some audio analyzing. Yeah. Um, which I oh, yeah, I shouldn't just click next to the microphone. What? <laughs> uh, that might have been... We might have taken yeah. that out. No, I think it's in here. Um, um, and we we map that to a custom property as well, which is yeah. always a nice way to do so if I, CSS effects. I think we visuals. did it to like this video here, and that if we clap, so maybe it can't read the microphone. Yeah, do you have mic permissions on here? I refresh the page. Um, oh, it's, oh, maybe there it's was because a get I, user media uh, error, which might. Um, when we were looking at console earlier, then maybe because I wasn't it, on. Ah, yeah. oh, it's because I wasn't on HTTPS. Oh, that was definitely not a letter. Yeah. Right. So now, in theory, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> loud noises also move it. Yeah. Is, yeah, I think that's done on a. Um. See, I'm going. Okay, no, no, it's just loud noises. <laughs> yeah. So a loud noise will trigger this like fuzzy effect where it it draws the image twice but like this like a yeah because we put that into the uniforms didn't we we did okay, yeah all right cool so there's a beat uniform there's a beat uniform um, um and you can you can extend that out quite easily because you can just do like a high frequency uniform and low frequency which is always good for yeah. hip hop i find yeah cool. pick up on the low frequency and you get like a really cool bass yeah that was a bit which um, which, which you wrote and then we've like turned that into a uh, yeah. Another uniform in the um, thing. Uh, so I think those are all up here. Um, so all of this code here is the code for generating the visuals. Um, so here are all the uniforms from the um, from the MIDI controller. So it basically listen for MIDI events on CC one. Um, no, call it CC one from the MIDI element with ID CC1. Um, there's a time uniform. 
Oh yes, this one here, the audio uniform. So this is the one which um, I think creates a uniform called beat. Every time the volume goes above like the threshold, which is the number 80. Yeah, and you can change that threshold. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this was a really cool effect and these all so these chunks are essentially um, like lumps of um, WebGL like shader code which like GLSL which gets all put together and then I also wrote a function so you can just write shader code yeah. directly into it um it was pretty okay like it was a nice effect like i probably couldn't just jump in and just like make changes uh because it's kind of intense but i'm glad that you said that because i know you've refreshed my memory on all of it because i think i came back to it for some reason recently and i was a bit like what do we do i can't remember now <laughs> like whoa this is all crazy but um, um the I think the most useful thing from this whole project is the is the MIDI controller um, web components which you made. Really? Because I think the most interesting bit is the <laughs> <laughs> integration of the WebGL <laughs> globs that you have, where you just everything's just pasted together. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, um, but this is so useful because then, in theory, like. We've defined a MIDI controller used in this HTML. And if I ever wanted to use this particular MIDI controller, the Akai, this one here, if I wanted to use it on a different website or a different project, I can just copy and paste that HTML. I should really pull this out for my project because it's not even just for that, because you can define the messages that come out of it. In, the, in those attributes, you can just map the pads, take MIDI pad, mm. um, and then you can emulate that as well. Just have like an 8 by 8 grid of MIDI pads, yeah. and just make sure that those values are the same as what is coming out of that. And what would be really nice is that you could, if you wanted to, um, um, like have a library of HTML snippets for different, with the default configurations from different pads. So you yeah. can be like, I'm using an Ableton copy and paste the snippet of HTML into your page and yeah. it's like now I have 64 buttons to do whatever I want with yeah and like if you like imagine being able to actually this is the slight trouble with um building I jump it's back on the camera because it was um so that's like the slight problem with um building like games and experiences with MIDI hardware because everyone is different hardware. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like a lot of the stuff you'd end up building with MIDI controllers is stuff that where you can take it around with the hardware. Um, this is a problem that we have talked about for a while now because it's true every single time. So I work with a collective where everybody has built their own software um, which for the most part we use MIDI controllers to control the software so that can be visualization software like we had there um, it, music software so software we use the MIDI controllers to, to, to control music um, software that controls lighting systems mm. and again um, the way that you do that is you take the MIDI messages and you convert them to DMX which is a protocol which is heavily based on MIDI uh, and you can control big sort of lighting rigs in like venues and stuff like that. But essentially, all of us uh, have MIDI controller hardware controlling what it is that we're performing and what it is that we're doing. And every single time we get a new MIDI controller, we, <laughs> or at least I do, but I do think I'm not the only one, is I sit there and I record all the messages that come out of the MIDI controller yeah. and then go back into the software and, you know, like I was saying at the beginning of the, what we were discussing, just go and write another piece of JSON, which has got all the messages in so that I can, you know, oh, another object as it was really, because yeah. it's there, me going, you know, um, I just got a MIDI fighter, so it'd be like MIDI fighter um, dot pad one dot yeah. on press, and that would call the numbers that I was getting out of it, okay. MIDI fighter dot pad two on release, because you've got a, you've got a down and you've got an up value, right? Yeah. Um, and that's how I 
I'd call it in the software, and it's it's kind of. I feel like there's got to be an easier way of doing that. Must be. <laughs> like, um, because yeah, every single one is is different. Even if you get the similar values, like I'm pretty sure your Novation Launchpad here, some of those buttons are going to give the same values as some of the pads on the back end. I'm sure they would. Yeah. Um, but you just don't know which ones. It will be funny if there's like these four little buttons here. It's like half yeah. this controller. <laughs> I bet you I bet you find it's useful because it's backwards. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, cool. I'm still so grateful you've given me this controller. I'm just like oh, freaking yeah. out so much. I'm, in like a day you're gonna have like LED splashing all over that thing. Although I yeah. might go home tomorrow and get the LED splash on my on my MIDI fighter because I've not done that yet. It's oh. definitely something I've got to get. Happening. So cool! You have the MIDI fighter. Uh, uh, which which what you have the like eight by eight one. Right? Yeah, there's a you see you get one with buttons, one with with dials, and you can get small ones, you can get big ones. MIDI fighter is it it's kind of ridiculously overpriced until you actually get it and you're like this is a really nice piece of hardware. It's made with like real arcade buttons, so they're really tactile oh. and they're actual like proper like buttony buttony buttons. Yeah. But um, I didn't notice until I got it. I should have really known this. So it's like a little box about this big, which is nice because it means I can travel with it. It's quite hardy. Um, I needed something with pressy buttons for what I wanted to use it for. It's got buttons on the side as well, which is great because that means you've got a couple of different bits of functionality. It's also got an accelerometer in it. So you can move it like this and like this. <laughs> and it's like the continuous controllers. So it That's gives you so continuous cool. controllers. Do the accelerometer? Oh, they come out as continuous controller. Yeah, yeah. So it's as if you've got like a slider. Oh. But you just lift the thing up and you're like, so cool. like wood, it's like backwards. So uh, that's going to have to be something. You know it's probably going to mix the video together. I'll probably be like, Do you know what mix. I really want to see that used for? What? Driving game. <laughs> and then you've got <gasps> a driving game with like 64 different horns. <laughs> And that's all it is. You just gonna, like, you be like, you're gonna make this for Ada and while I do is I make one. I mean, look what I did. Boop, boop. But <laughs> uh, so you can good. also do something like driving around and then you push one and then it like it beats the horn and then you get like some cool light effect. Like, oh, yeah, on. like the, uh, the light effects in the center. I've got, to, I've got to figure out how to. Because that's the thing that looks the coolest, right? Yeah, you I love the thing where you do like, it and you get like, you push a button and you get like a ripple go like, yeah, oh, yeah. Pop, pop, pop. See, yeah. I go, I've got to build this. And like, I can build the ripples and stuff. Like, I'm a graphics developer by, by like... I know. <laughs> so, like, that's what I really want to, like, get in there and, uh, and build. Um, so cool. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, we were saying, like, the... Um, the interesting thing about MIDI is that, like, because it's not just for musical instruments, like, Anything you build where you're like, oh, I wish I had a, like, a keyboard and mouse isn't the ideal interface for this situation. Like, I need slight, I need dials, I need buttons, I need generic things. And that's when, like, MIDI starts to become really interesting. Because you can... I think for, for people that don't always work with audio, yeah. Because I think everybody thinks that in their head, but actually... Um, there are some really interesting uses already of MIDI with the web, which haven't got anything to do with audio. Yeah. Um, there's a guy up in Scotland, I think it's Laurie Cape. Yeah. And he built, there's a little video on YouTube, we'll try and find it for the video on here. Yeah. Um, and he built uh, a typography um, investigator with a MIDI controller. So you, he just has a page of all the typography that he might want to use on his website. And you just turn all the CCs and it gets bigger, it gets smaller, the font changes, like all of this stuff just from like the dials and the MIDI so controller. Like, like, this is the best use of this MIDI yeah. controller. You were telling me about the fonts. Was this using like the um the like the new oh what's it called? The the fonts where you could variable the fonts? Variable no, font. I don't think so because it yeah. what like I've been using that video for at least a year mm. um, as an example of when you can use web MIDI without sound. Um, maybe we could like, just have a tweet and ask him because that would be amazing as well. Like, yeah. I mean, we could build something like that now because I haven't done anything with variable fonts. Oh yeah, we wanted to do some coding. Let's 
Let's do it. I haven't touched variable fonts either. Let's, yeah, because we're it. going to do some audio coding, but whatever, we can do audio coding next. Yeah. Time. So we've already got MIDI messages coming out of our MIDI controller here. Yeah. It's so all, all we Chrome. need to do, because um, I haven't done anything with variable fonts, and I'm really interested. All right. Cool. Is what we could do very simply and easily. So what we need to be accessing is the value rather than the whole event. Yeah. I believe. So I'm gonna clear that. Cool. Yeah. Um. Actually, I just had a thought. We could use the web components, which we wrote earlier. Like, literally the code from this thing, because it's already mapped out for this. Okay. Like that. Um, we could fork that glitch project and then rip out anything that we don't need. Uh, or do the opposite. Unfortunately, the glitch version of that project was the one that was broken because it was uh, looking for just the midi.js. Yeah. Yeah. But we can copy and paste the links from here. So yeah, that's what we want. Um, is there a is that being extended from another components? Um, the components HTML element plus. Oh yeah, thank you. Well remember. What is web component web component? Is that a polyfill? That's the polyfill, yeah. Okay. Um, but we can leave the polyfill out because web components work everywhere these days. Oh, brilliant. Um, well, everywhere that matters. <coughs> Mobile. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do have to use Chrome for this because Firefox doesn't support MIDI yet, which is yeah. a bit of a shame. Um, cool. So I'm going to paste this into here. So yeah, we don't need any of my graphic stuff. We do need a text in filters. Yeah, we don't need any of that. Cool. And then copy and paste the URL from the thing which I just closed. Right, there we go. Cool. Cool, so HTTPS. So we just imported those and um the doo -doo -doo -doo. Did I just close that page after copy and paste? I think I did. Yeah. And then we want our Copy and paste that. Are we going to see the power of web components? I think we are about to see the power of web components. Whoa. This is going to be a bit crazy if this works. I'm like, whoa! Yeah, so um, there's a little bit of styling that we probably need to do. Um, I found yeah. it actually quite difficult. Um, this is the first time I've used web components extensively. Yeah. Um, Am I getting my words modelled up today? Probably am. It's not my, it's not my forte. Um, when it was a struggle for me to work out which styles should be global, so which styles are the styles for the actual website, and which yeah. styles are the component-based styles. Mm. Um, and it's been it was that was quite an interesting challenge I found. It is tricky to try and draw the line, like what should be. Because I think like fonts, like typefaces and colors are inherited, but like other stuff in the sh in in the styles in the shadow DOM, like is kind of cut off, like it's separated from the rest of the document. Exactly. Um, so it's kind of tricky to decide like what should be part of the. Yeah, um, and like something like you've got the pad, right? Mm. And you're like, if I set a width and a height on this pad. Which I could do because um, it's essentially a button and when you use an HTML button or input or something like that without any other styling day, these things are set. Yeah. Right? And we're so used to sort of overriding that. But I just felt like that wasn't nice to pick for. <laughs> like I have specifically yeah. set this to be this height and this so, width. And yeah, yeah it's gonna if be you, I made it difficult for you to change. If you set it in the host property of the style 
that anything which you put in there can be overwritten by external um, things. So, um, uh -huh. and I think this is something I need to revisit when um, I pull out those components so that they can just be separate things um, and make available to people. So we Im we just imported the the MIDI controllers um, JavaScript. JavaScript. We copy and pasted in the the layout of this um, MIDI, MIDI controller. MIDI so controller. We copy and pasted in the web components that we had already built for other application. Yeah. Um, so we've basically set up an interface which emulates the MIDI controller. So you can either press buttons on the MIDI controller, or you can press them on the interface in our HTML. Yeah. Now we're going to include a variable font in our CSS. So that we can control it. So we can with... control it with the MIDI controller. Yeah. And we're using this Google font spectral from um, Google fonts. Which apparently does all the variable stuff that we need it to do. Yeah. So let's see. So um, add the import. Um, you should be able to just change Benton Sands to. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. Let me one. Might be a nice idea. So, spectral. Cool. Okay. So, we need to find out what um, properties you can change. Yeah, I can that. Let's put. Let's put some custom properties in the CSS for the things that we can change on the variable font. Okay. Um, and then so we can update them in the JavaScript. Um, let's MDM dock it because yeah. I'm not entirely sure. MDM docks the variable fonts. Guide. There's a whole guide for us. Um, so. Right, font variation. Yes. Okay, cool. It is. So this seems like something we can do with um, things. So all right. So I reckon we should set these numbers to be custom properties. Yes, I hundred percent agree. I don't know what, what weight and grad is, but we'll just have to find out. Yeah, let's see what it looks like. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure we could just see what weight is, but I'm interested in the other ones. So unfortunately, it looks exactly the same. So that made no... So... So I reckon this isn't the variable version. Oh, okay, right. Gingham, free variable font. Oof. There we go. Yeah, download. Can you, oh uh, yeah, you can upload to Grit, can't you? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, uh, copy. You can do this in right. minutes. Oh yeah, Maybe. definitely. Because I keep chatting too much. Cool. Um, Copy URL. Ah, um, so good. So, um, uh, how do you define a font again? Uh, just do the at import URL. It should work. Same. Oh no, 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 no. you can't. Uh, um, CSS define. Do you want to do at font face? Yeah. But I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, at font face. <laughs> I have this as a snippet in Sublime. Oh, yeah. Specifically, just. Yeah, there you go. I mean, we actually just took that off from you three. Oh, no, yeah, we did you double. Don't, don't tell my students. I'll, I'll cut that from the from the video. No one needs to know that we just went to W3 schools. I mean, uh, you, we will probably have to specify type. Um, or specify type. Let's see what happens. Uh, uh, let's see if it loads. 
Oh yeah, it's a minus five point. I'll just call it gingham. Do you think grad is? Yeah, so that once again isn't. Oh no, there we go. So this is doing stuff. Oh cool, oh great, okay. So I'm gonna get rid of that. Um, let's put this on a CSS property. So let's go var, let's just call it CC1 um, and body. C1 is 100. Do it for grad as well. Do, do CC2 for grad. Okay. Um, Just this one here. There we go. So in. Okay, no, that's fine. So yeah, if we set body or well, CC one ten fifty or oh, one, so it doesn't seem to be. Do four hundred? Yeah. There you go. It's working. So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to take the third value from that array. It's work. It's what if I do? I'm a CC array. You sure it's working? Yeah, I'm 100 percent sure. 400 is like normal weight, and then oh. 700 is like bold. So there you oh, go. Oh yeah, okay. So you know we're going to need to be changing these values quite a lot to see a difference. Cool. Um, so this third value in this array that's coming out of the CC, so these ones yeah. here, right? That's the one that's going to change, but it only goes from naught to one, two, seven. seven. So we want to times it by eight or something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Cool. So if the second value is five, I guess, because um, these are all different. Um, so yeah. So I think the, these go the other way around. So that one's one, this one's two, that one's three. That all right, one's cool. Four. Okay, so if the value is one, <laughs> then make it change it to the third value. Um, uh, So yeah, um, document dot um, style dot as it set attribute. Um, right, uh, document. I uh, use document dot. Oh, document dot body dot style dot set set property. Here it is, document dot mm, yeah. CC one a hundred. That seems awesome. to work. Yeah. Right, so I'm just gonna be really lazy and be like, um, so CC plus one <laughs> to its second value um. times eight. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Do we have too many brackets in the end? <laughs> um, a two. Yeah, I think you can tweak that bracket. Yes. Cool. Yeah. So if we re refresh it. <laughs> oh. Yes. Cool. Nice. Yeah, so grad. I want, to, I want to see what grad does. So I don't think grad does anything. Oh, that's a shame. But if we look we, at MDN docs and just have a quick look and see what. But if we look at Gingham, we can probably see what. Um, 
what this comes with. Uh, So wide is the animation now. See what's happening on wide. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do I view the animations? Um, we could just have where is. Oh, Ginnam settings. So it's got weight and width. There we go. Weight and width. Okay. Cool. Let's so the second one to width. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so, so it caps wide. out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it works. It works. Yeah. See, we can oh. use a mini controller to change our variable font setting. I can't Woo! believe we just did that in like five minutes. <laughs> five. Yeah. Thank you so you much did. for coming. And that's okay. I'm so sorry. I've got to run. Next yeah, time we'll make some noises. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> okay. uh, um, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, once I get this working, and you're next back in London. Okay. We'll do something amazing with this, and we're yeah. gonna have noises coming up all these buttons. Yeah, and, like, and lights. And lights. Yeah, awesome. Cool, that was amazing. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. That's all right, and I'm hopefully, I'll see you again really soon. Oh, yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll see you soon. You have to dash. You can probably, I'll just close the stream and. I'm, w yeah. I'm hoping that there was a nice cut there. Uh, yeah, okay. there probably is. Right. Bye, everyone. Bye. We gotta go. I'll see ya. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I wanna go. <gasps> uh, yes. So that was um, Ada's Twitch Tech Talks. Me and Ruth having a chat. Um, thank you all for coming. Bye.